Welcome to this video version of the executive summary of the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group Report being released on August 18th, 2021. Note that a longer version of this report is available online, and if I have time, I'll post a video with the additional details covered there. Here, I'll talk about the highlights of the group's recent analysis, including upcoming projections for cases and hospitalizations. So first, a quick reminder of who we are. That's me right here, Eric Citrenbaum. And the group more generally consists of academics from University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, and University of Victoria, as well as a few associated individuals with expertise covering data analysis and modeling in epidemiology and related areas. We are independent of the BC government and provide an independent voice to supplement efforts at the BC CDC and efforts within the government itself. So the first <clears throat> important point that I want to highlight is that we are now seeing exponential growth in all regions of the province. So remember that a, a little while ago, just last week, we had uh, we had concerns about the Okanagan growing very quickly. And you'll notice we're on a log plot here. The way we can see that is the tick marks here, each tick mark as it goes up, the number doubles. And so that's what we call a log plot. And on a log plot, a straight line, increasing straight line represents exponential growth. A decreasing straight line represents exponential decay. You'll notice we don't see any decreasing straight lines here. These lines, they wiggle a little bit, but for the most part, they have this fairly consistent upstroke. And that tells us that since early July, right across the board, we have seen exponential growth. You'll notice that the numbers have been higher in the Okanagan and um, Kootenai boundary, but the growth rate, which is really a critical feature here, is um, pretty consistent across. We have, we're seeing doubling times of around nine days or less throughout the province. The next important point I want to get across has to do with hospitalizations as they relate to changing case counts. So one useful tool for estimating expected hospitalizations is the number of newly confirmed cases. So as you can see in this plot on the left here, uh, going back all the way to October, is that the fraction of confirmed cases that end up in the hospital has remained relatively constant. So this is that fraction of cases that end up in the hospital. And you can see that they're all within this band and they kind of hover around somewhere between two and a half and five uh, percent of all cases. On the right, we see something very similar with the ICU numbers, but just at a lower level. So up here, we're at around, let's say, three or four percent. Down here, we're in the range of maybe just under one percent. OK, um, the simplest way to understand this is that most confirmed cases and most hospitalizations are in unvaccinated individuals. There are many factors that could have changed this ratio. For example, the age distribution of vaccination, the age distribution of the severity of infection, testing protocols, changes in undetected infections, etc. Any of these could have pushed that ratio up or down. But the remarkable fact that is unambiguous from the data here is that it hasn't really changed all that much. This makes it a useful tool for um, projecting into the future if we know if we have a model for predicting cases that's successful, we can use this observation here to extend that to projecting hospitalizations and ICU numbers. So here's another perspective on that, which you see here again on a log plot, just to make the small behavior in at low numbers as clear as we can see in large numbers up here. And these large numbers, they look a little unfamiliar perhaps on the log scale, but here is the second wave squished down because of the log representation. And here's the third wave and the valley that we went through uh, recently in June and the current ongoing upstroke here. So one of the most noticeable features about this, if you're looking at the hospitalizations and ICU numbers relative to the case counts, is that there's a lag and that's um, due to the fact that when somebody gets sick, it may take a little while before they, uh, they show up in the hospital. So there's a lag and then another lag before they end up in the ICU. Um, but that lag aside, you can see that there's a clear mirroring of the behavior all the way back to October, including this valley here in June, which shows up in the hospital and ICU numbers a little bit later. And the ongoing rise in case numbers is now starting to show in the data in hospitalizations and in the ICU. And this is consistent with that constant ratio for each of the two of them that I showed you on the previous slide. 
Okay, so uh, I mentioned that having this hospitalization um, this hospitalization factor is useful if you have a model for case numbers. So let's take a look at this model here. This is Dean Carlin's model for um, for predicting cases, and this is a multi-strain model. He has the original uh, COVID variant back here being taken over by alpha, and then now delta taking over from alpha. And the green dots, the small green dots, are data data on the daily basis, and then the large green dots are weekly averages. And you can see that his model is fitting the data very well and has been for a long time. And you can see now we have this upstroke here with Delta in the last um, month and a half. Okay, so, um, and, and also this constant factor for getting hospitalizations in ICU, you can see that has allowed him to um, give us a pretty good fit to historical data. And now the question is going forward. So so how good is this model at forecasting? It, it's it managed to fit the data, but can it can it you know sort of project forward into the future? And that relies on a key assumption that is we assume if we assume that things are not changing at all going forward, then we're able to use all the same parameters of this fit to predict or project what might happen in the future. So that gives us a projection of case counts and our hospitalization and ICU factor will allow us to also predict what's gonna go on here. So let me um, just show you a slightly different way of displaying the data here. I've, I've got the, instead of putting the case counts on a linear scale, now I've put them onto, well, Dean has put them onto a log scale for me. And so I'm zooming in on this section here and this nice U shape turns into a sharper V shape just because of the features of how log plots distort things. And you can see here on a log plot, like I said, linear is growth or linear is exponential. So in this case, this is exponential decline with a slight curve because of vaccination. And again, here, this growth is almost a straight line with a slight bend because of ongoing but less rapid vaccination. Okay, so this is the view I'm gonna show you just so we can see all of that at the same time over the next few slides. And these are supposed to build your confidence in the model's ability to project forward. This is data from our July 28th report. And you can see that we were seeing that early turnaround after the July 1st lifting of measures and or the introduction or growth of Delta. August 3rd, you can see that red line is now very similar. Let me flip back and forth again so that you can see that, that that new prediction, this is a new a new prediction or new uh, fitting, um, but it looks very similar to the old and we're still following right along that same line. Go forward another week and we're still following roughly that same curve, that, that uh, Delta pr um, prediction there. And one more to August 16th. And you can see yet again, we're still marching along that same curve. So that gives us confidence that under the assumption that things don't change as they appear not to have changed over the last few weeks, we can use this model to project forward in time. One interesting side note here is that Dean's model is capable of, or you know, it's always looking for um, breakpoints in transmission. So it'll automatically identify if there's been some change in the transmission rate, and it'll mark that and change the parameters from that point forward. And you can see that the straight line that was being followed up until the introduction of regional measures in the Okanagan changed shortly after this breakpoint to a lower angle here, which shows us the effect of those measures. It wasn't enough to turn it around, but it was enough to make a detectable, a detectable bend in that curve. So let me just flip through these slides a couple times so you can see just how well the data lies along that very consistent uh, fit curve. Hopefully now you have some confidence in the um, predictive power as long as we're under this assumption of no change in conditions, we can estimate future. And what you see here is just the projection of exponential growth due to Delta and correspondingly the increase in hospital and ICU occupancy. I'll show you a little bit further forward in time in a moment, but first I want to just highlight what's happening with kids. So um, children make up a, a much larger portion of the unvaccinated population than the total population. Uh, so children under the age of 20 are about 9% of the population. Sorry, children under 10 are about 9% of the population, but they represent 36% of the unvaccinated population. And that's not going to change until the vaccines have been approved for kids under 12, and those kids have gone through the two-dose vaccination protocol and waited a couple weeks even beyond that. Um, but in the meantime, what we're looking at is a September, October, November wave that will include those unvaccinated 
children, and it'll include uh, quite large uh, case counts in that age cohort. So let me jump back now to the whole population, as I was saying I would a few slides ago. So what you're seeing here is just that the exact same um, the exact same model fit with projection, but now instead of just going out until somewhere in, I think it was September, uh, this is now showing all the way through October, November, December. And you can see this classic uh, epidemic outbreak curve here, where it grows exponentially until the population has a sufficiently large immunity that it turns around, and this is this turnaround is related to that herd immunity concept. And so we see that we have this um, sort of conclusion of the epidemic, but it's a dramatic conclusion. You'll notice this is the peak of the third wave here, and this is what we're projecting as the peak of a fourth wave if we leave things unchanged as currently. And looking at hospitalizations in ICU, you can see that the hospitalization count gets quite dramatic, as does the ICU, well above where it was when it was causing enough concern for measures to be introduced during the third wave back in May. So here in this slide, we're showing what happens if we do something instead of leaving it uh, under current conditions and letting that uh, epidemic curve rip through the population. What if we expand vaccination and let's say here we're assuming if we expand it, increase it by 2,000 per day starting next week until reaching a population, 90% a of the population vaccinated. And if we just do that alone, this curve, the curve that I showed on the previous slide, gets shortened a little bit, but still has quite a big outbreak. And so it's it's clear that, you know, in order to really keep this under control, measures and vaccination expansion are important. And the measures here are only imposed for six weeks to allow for the vaccination process to cover more of the population. And so if we do that, then you can see that the fourth peak will be damp down enough so that the hospitalization numbers, our projection is that they will only reach under these conditions, they'll only reach about uh, twice the peak hospitalization occupancy that we saw during the third wave. Now the measures here that are being imposed through this six week period are, uh, are somewhere between our current measures and what we were living with through April and at the beginning of May. So um, not the full kind of May, April, May uh, circuit breaker, but halfway between that and what we have now. So that seems like um, uh, enough to keep um, the outbreak that we're projecting under control. So let me summarize. Um, as we've seen in the US and other provinces in Canada, BC has experienced a rapid growth due to the Delta variant. Um, so if you've been keeping track of the US news on COVID, um, they now have more than 90% um, of their ICU beds currently in use, and demand is continuing to rise. Lots of pressure on their uh, health, health system. Um, and states are already starting to see an uh, increase in hospitalizations of children, um, and um, children hospitals are reporting uh, getting close to capacity in some places. Now, as we've shown here, BC looks like it's on the same path um, and uh, with serious consequences for uh, pressure on our healthcare system. So uh, as we've outlined in the modeling, uh, uh, some measures to reduce transmission temporarily, as well as aggressive expansion of vaccination are at least you know, uh, enough to, to do something to limit the damage or the impact on our healthcare system and on our, um, our, our citizens. Okay, well, thanks for listening. And uh, if you want more on this report, you can go to the website linked in the description below the video and find the longer version of the report, as well as uh, any of our older reports. We've had a couple that I didn't do any videos on. There was an interim report uh, last week, and, um, and they're all uh, available on our website.